Good evening, and welcome to tonight's conversation with Davidson College President Carol Quillen and Dr. Clint Smith, Davidson Class of 2010, and author of the number one selection on the New York Times bestseller list, How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. I'm Lisa Combs, the Executive Director of Engagement at Davidson. Tonight's event is co-hosted by Davidson College and Main Street Books. Later in the program, another fellow Wildcat, Beth Helfrich from Main Street Books, will moderate questions from the audience. First, a few housekeeping tips. For all questions or comments this evening, we will be using Zoom's chat function. If you click the chat button at the bottom center of your screen, a chat window will open and you can type in your question or comment for all panelists. We only have an hour and I expect that this time will fly by. So no, we may not get to all the questions, but we will try. And now it is my honor to introduce this evening's speakers. Carol Quillen became Davidson College's 18th president in August of 2011. An historian by training, President Quillen has led the college in fulfilling our mission, developing humane instincts in our students and celebrating the lives of leadership and service our alums lead around the world. President Quillen often speaks to the disproportionate impact Davidson graduates have in their communities and has focused on cultivating the qualities needed in our world today. Leadership, integrity, curiosity, and empathy. Clint Smith is a staff writer at The Atlantic and the author of the poetry collection, Counting Descent, which won the 2017 Literary Award for Best Poetry Book from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association and was a finalist for an NAACP Image Award. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The New Republic, Poetry Magazine, The Paris Review, and the Harvard Educational Review, among others. Clint's two TED Talks, The Danger of Silence and How to Raise a Black Son in America, have been viewed more than nine million times. A native of New Orleans, Clint played soccer at Davidson and majored in English. He recently earned his PhD in education from Harvard University, following time spent teaching English at the high school level in Maryland. Clint and his young family live in the Washington, D.C. area, where he also teaches writing and literature in the D.C. Central Detention Facility. We are thrilled to welcome Clint back to Davidson, even if it is only virtually. Carol and Clint, we look forward to your conversation. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. Hey, Clint, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here with us. Such a pleasure to, to be back, as back as, as back as one can be. Yeah, well, we, yeah, and, and I guess you've had such a, a whirlwind of these events recently, given the amazing success of your wonderful book. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting because I've, I've just been sitting in this spot for, <laughs> uh, but I feel like I've been all over the country in so many ways. I, you know, one thing that a virtual tour does allow for is it allows you to be in conversation with a whole host of um, people who you might not otherwise be able to, to be. And it also allows you to have people watch your events who might not be able to, whether for reasons of disability, whether they have young kids, whether, you know, um, whatever the reason, whether they live in a more rural area, might not be able to come to uh, an event in, um, you know, New York or DC or San Francisco or, or even Davidson. So um, I'm grateful for the way that it has opened up space. And I imagine that whatever comes after this will be some sort of hybrid where, um, you know, you have in-person events, which you can't replicate. I mean, there's nothing like being, uh, being with people in the same room, but, uh, but it access wise, it has just sort of opened up the possibilities for so many. And, uh, and it's been, it's been great. I'm just overwhelmed by the gratitude. It's like I told you before, I think I'm people are like, how are you feeling? And, and I'm like, uh, I tell them, I feel like a dog who puts their head out of the window. Um, yeah, of a moving car and you're just like being blown in the face by by wind and you're having a great time and then you pull your head back and you realize that you're dehydrated so <laughs> it's been it's been amazing I just I could have never imagined that it would be what it has been um and I'm just 
very grateful, very grateful. Well, we are, we're excited and grateful to you for making time for, for us in this tour. And I think as a way of starting, um, I know we'd love to hear you read from your work if you'd be willing to share with us in that way. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so as many folks know, uh, although this is a narrative nonfiction book, um, I came to writing as, as a poet um, at Davidson College. Uh, shout out to Free Word, uh, which I founded in 2009. Um, and, you know, we did our best sort of cosplay of, of Dead Poets Society um, when we were, we'd be in the top room of, of chambers on Sunday evenings practicing our poems. And it was such a, a hodgepodge group of, of amazing people um, who, who just loved writing and loved literature and, and wanted to figure out what it meant to perform it out loud. Um, and I'll always be so grateful for that time and that space and, uh, and for Davidson for being the sort of place um, that allowed someone who from age five to 17 thought that I was going to be a professional soccer player um, and then uh, had that dream uh, humbly, humbly diminished, I will say, um, but allowed me to figure out who I was outside of the soccer field, which I think is emblematic of, of Davidson and emblematic of liberal arts education. And, you know, I got to write for the school paper and join a fraternity and start a poetry group and, um, you know, all of that is is deeply tied to the fact that I get to make a living as a as a writer now, um, and and to make a, a life of ideas and words and language and history in ways that I could never imagine. But I don't mean to make this a Davidson Davidson ad, um, and I know we have limited time, so I want to um, share a poem with you all that was uh, the sort of origin story or the origin point of the book. Um, Poems for me are a mechanism. They are both the creation of art, but they are also a, a way for me to think through a set of questions, a set of problems, um, a set of ideas, and to figure out where I come down on it. Um, and, and sometimes to figure out that I don't have a position on it. I think part of what I love about poetry is that it allows you to wrestle with questions without necessarily having to find an answer to those questions. So uh, I'm gonna share this poem, which was, I wrote when I was beginning to explore all these questions a few years ago. Uh, and when you're a poet writing nonfiction, sometimes you'll write a poem and then you'll turn the stanzas into the paragraphs and the line breaks into commas and periods and you'll like slide it in to the end of one of the sections of your, your chapter as I did, um, and then uh, just call it, call it a piece of part of an essay. So um, I'll do this poem and then we'll hop into conversation. Growing up, the iconography of the Confederacy was an ever-present fixture of my daily life. Every day on the way to school, I passed a statue of PGT Beauregard riding on horseback, his Confederate uniform slung over his shoulder, and his military cap pulled far down over his eyes. As a child, I did not know who PGT Beauregard was. I did not know he was the man who ordered the first attack that opened the Civil War. I did not know he was one of the architects who designed the Confederate battle flag. I did not know he led an army predicated on maintaining the institution of slavery. What I knew is that he looked like so many of the other statues that ornamented the edges of this city. These copper garlands of a past that saw truth as something that should be buried underground and silenced by the soil. After the war, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy reshaped the contours of treason into something they could name as honorable. We call it the lost cause, and it crept its way into textbooks that attempted to cover up a crime that was still unfolding. They told us that Robert E. Lee was an honorable man, guilty of nothing but fighting for the state and the people that he loved, that the Southern flag was about heritage and remembering those slain fighting to preserve their way of life. But see, the thing about the lost cause is that it's only lost if you're not actually looking. The thing about heritage is that it's a word that also means I'm ignoring what we did to you. I was taught the Civil War wasn't about slavery, but I was never taught how the declarations of Confederate secession had the promise of human bondage carved into its stone. I was taught the war was about economics, but I was never taught that in 1860, the four million enslaved black people were worth more than every bank, factory and railroad combined. I was taught the civil war was about states rights, but I was never taught how the Fugitive Slave Act could care less about a border and spell Georgia and Massachusetts the exact same way. It's easy to look at a flag and call it heritage when you don't see the black bodies buried behind it. It's easy to look at a statue and call it history when you ignore the laws written in its wake. I come from a city abounding with statues of white men on pedestals and black children playing beneath them, where we played trumpets and trombones to drown out the Dixie song that still whistled in the wind. 
in New Orleans, there are over 100 schools, roads, and buildings named for Confederates and slaveholders. Every day, Black children walk into buildings named after people who never wanted them to be there. Every time I return home, I drive on streets named for those who would have wanted me in chains. Go straight for two miles on Robert E. Lee, take a left on Jefferson Davis, make the first right on Claiborne translation, go straight for two miles on the general who slaughtered hundreds of black soldiers who were trying to surrender, take a left on the president of the Confederacy who made the torture of black bodies the cornerstone of his new nation, make the first right on the man who permitted the heads of rebelling slaves to be put on stakes and spread across the city in order to, pre to prevent the others from getting any ideas. What name is there for this sort of violence? What do you call it when the road you walk on is named for those who imagined you under the noose? What do you call it when the roof over your head is named after people who would have wanted the bricks to crush you? And that's that poem slash excerpt adaptation from the book. Well, it's, um... You know, I've heard I've heard you read that before, and it's it's an incredibly um, powerful and moving um, piece of work. I, I think you know, as a historian, it also makes me think about the incredible difficulty, like the massive undertaking of your book, which is um, um, the word you use is reckoning, right? What does it mean to reckon with the past, and what does it mean? to think about the ways in which the past relates to the present. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. You know, you, you talk in your book about how your students, when you were teaching and you saw the ways in which the past shaped the daily lives of your students. And, um, and you've, you've talked before about how history is difficult and talking about sexual violence and extreme violence is difficult and so important to do. And I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on that, both the word reckoning and your sort of, um, any advice you have for people who are trying to present a more honest view of, of our own history? Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the process of writing this book over the course of the last four years has been an effort to more fully account for uh, a history that has shaped the contemporary landscape of inequality in this country that I felt like I had a decent understanding of but didn't fully understand. Uh, I think I've spent the last several years reading books on the story, you know, exploring the historiography of slavery um, and inequality more, more broadly in a, in a sort of both class, economic and racial context, and trying to gain a, a sort of toolkit or a framework with which to more effectively make sense of why our society looks the way that it does today. I think you mentioned my teaching, I think all the time about a James Baldwin essay, uh, that he wrote in 19, he published in 1964. It's based on a speech that he gave in 1963 to a group of New York City educators, and it's called Talk to Teachers. And, and in it, he says a lot of remarkable things because he's Baldwin, but one of the things that he says is that Black children have been told over and over and over again by, by this society that they are criminal. And the role of the teacher, and he's saying teacher here literally, but also as a sort of metonym for the larger society, the role of the teacher is to help that child understand that even though the world tells them that they are criminal, it is in fact the society and the history that created the conditions that that child is growing up in that is the real criminal, right? It is the history, it is the policy. And for many of us, that's intuitive, that feels very clear, that feels very obvious. But I think we can forget or underappreciate the extent to which for many people across this country, we are given information that runs counter to that. And I think of my own childhood, I think Part of why I wanted to write this book was because when I was a kid, I experienced a sort of social and emotional paralysis um, because I was inundated with these messages about how New Orleans was the murder capital of the nation and incarcerated more people per capita than China, Iran, and Russia. And the, there was a, a culture of pathology with people who lived in the projects and in poverty. And implicit within that was a criticism, uh, not so subtle, of, of Black people in New Orleans, given that majority, uh, New Orleans was a majority Black city. And so I was being inundated with these messages about why my city looked the way that it did, why Black people in New Orleans, and, and as a sort of microcosm for this country, lived in the conditions that we did. And feeling like I didn't have the language or the toolkit with which to push back mm -hmm. against it. Like I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know how to say it was wrong. And I think that's some of sort of the insidiousness that Baldwin alludes to, right? Where like, the messages that so many young people get, not just black children, but like white children, Asian children, Latinx children, all children, 
get certain messages about why this our society, why this country looks the way that it does. And if you are not being given the history to help you fully understand how, you know, in this context, our contemporary social, political, and economic infrastructure is shaped by slavery in profound ways. Um, and the legacy of slavery, or as the uh, scholar Sadia Hartman says, the, the afterlife of slavery, how that shapes our contemporary landscape of inequality, then you're going to fall into the trap of thinking that the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way is somehow simply because of the people in those communities, rather than what has been done to those communities and continues to be done to those communities generation after generation after generation. Yeah. I mean, I, and so, I mean, I, I get the sense when I, when I read your writing or listen to you talk that for you, learning this history is liberating. It's profoundly liberating and empowering because it gives you the tools you need to understand the world in which you live in a way that doesn't make it your fault, right? It's not, it's not, it's not inexplicable. It's not mysterious. It's not something that just happened. It was an intentionally produced thing. And here's how. Um, there, I think there's also a sense of sometimes, like it's hard to teach these difficult subjects, right? It's really, it's hard to, to, to talk with, it's hard to talk with students about these extraordinary scenes of violence and, and, to, and to communicate those with them. And so g g your generosity of spirit is so apparent in your book. Do you have advice for other educators who, who want to give students this toolkit um, in a way that um, respects the difficulty of the material. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to not pretend like it's not hard stuff to talk about because it absolutely is. Um, I mean, I think the thing that I think about all the time as a sort of way to ground the conversation is just helping young people, and, and I say young people, but I think this is the case for adults as well, helping folks understand how recent this was. I mean, the way, that, you know, I keep telling people the way we talk about slavery or the way that I was taught about slavery and growing up was in like elementary and middle school was as if it was in the Jurassic period, right? That it was like <laughs> dinosaurs and the Flintstones yeah. and slavery, like that they all existed at the yeah. same time. And, yeah. and slavery existed in this country, if we're going to think about 1619 as the sort of symbolic marker of the beginning of slavery in the British colonies, existed in this country for 250 years and it was only not existed for around 150. And so one, you have an institution that existed for a hundred years longer than it hasn't. And then also, you know, the, the example I give often is that the woman who opened the museum, the, not the National Museum of African American History and Culture alongside the Obama family in 2016 was the daughter of an enslaved person. Like not yeah. the granddaughter or the great granddaughter, she was the daughter yeah. of someone who was born into intergenerational chattel slavery. Yeah. My grandfather's grandfather was enslaved, right? So when my four-year-old son sits on my grandfather's lap, I imagine my grandfather sitting on his grandfather's lap. And it is a further reminder of our sort of temporal proximity to this period of time. And part of what I want the book to do is give us a sense of our physical proximity to this landscape yeah. and to the sort of scars that are etched in the landscape of this country um, and how it has been shaped by slavery, but also our, our temporal proximity, right? Like that there are still people alive today who knew and were raised by and in community with people who were born into bondage. They were still interviewing people who were enslaved in the late 1930s, people who lived into the, the, into the 40s um, who were enslaved. And so it was, I think, part of one, of the, one of the things that teachers can do is make sure that we sort of ground our students in understanding how, re in the scope of human history, how recent this was. Because yeah. going back to what we said before, you can't understand that slavery was only a few generations ago and that there are people who are alive today who had my like, grandparents who were enslaved or parents who were enslaved and, and not recognize that any notion or idea that somebody would suggest that that has nothing to do with what the contemporary landscape of inequality looks like. Like that idea would be both, you, it would clearly be both morally and intellectually disingenuous. Um, so I think first is grounding it in the proximity. And then I think the other part is telling a, like a holistic story of what slavery was and how it impacted people. One of the things I write about in the book was, is how so often I was only taught the stories of Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, um, if you're lucky, uh, Harriet Jacobs, a lot of yeah. Yeah. And those stories are very important to share. They are also not reflective of the lives of most enslaved people. Like these are, these are not just extraordinary enslaved people, like these are extraordinary 
individuals. Like yeah. the universe does not make a lot of people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. And so yeah. there's a reason that we are drawn to them because their lives are so compelling and remarkable. It's like, wow, they ran away. She ran away and came back and saved all these people. Wow, he ran away and like fought his slave breaker when he was a teenager and then like became this Atlas speaker and writer and wrote these beautiful, I mean, they're so compelling. But I think that I, I remember for me, I was, if those are the only stories you are receiving of enslaved people. Yeah. And the sort of adverse impact of it might be, you know, and in my case, I remember being like, well, they ran away. Why didn't everybody run away? Yeah. Right? Like, and then, and then the mo more insidious version of that is like, well, if you didn't run away, then did you want to, did you want to be, in, you know, and, and it's, it's almost shameful to even say now, but like, that's how young people's minds works. And even just like making sure that we, so one, I think providing, you know, the more narratives uh, of, that reflect the totality of, yeah. of enslaved people um, and, and the lives that they lived and giving a wholer, a more holistic account of what resistance looked like, a more holistic account of what, um, what the lives of folks look like. Because for, for the thing about slavery is that it was this, it was an unfathomable and just an unfathomably cruel institution. And mil you had millions of people who were navigating it millions of different ways, who were people and who were just trying to like carve out a life for themselves and meaning for themselves and uh, identities. And that meant like falling in love and loving their children and building community and dancing together on outside uh, by a fire on a Saturday night or skipping rocks across the creek, these reclamations of agency, of personhood that are essential in understanding and remembering that this institution that attempted to render people as chattel failed because yeah. they were always grounding themselves in, in their humanity. And so I think um, that is a big part of it is like making sure that we're telling a holistic story of, of what slavery was and, and that it was human beings, you know, yeah. in all the sort of small, granular, minute ways that we are all human, um, how it impacted them and how people resisted in those small but important ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and that it, you know, that um, it failed for people in these small, this is how it failed, right? This is a demonstration to an inch of how it failed. It wasn't just in running away, but in these other small acts of agency, as you say, these, these daily reclamations of one's humanity in the face of this horrific and brutal institution, right? So it, I think that's, um, I, I think that's helpful. Yeah, and, and even thinking about, I mean, just small things. Like I yeah. think about when I went to the Whitney, how Yvonne Holden, one of the guides there, one of the things that she said was, people don't often think about how, they're like, well, why didn't you run away? Why didn't this person stay? And there's a lot, a lot yeah. of reasons people don't run away. I mean, one, the, the so many of the people, the stories of people who ran away, they were living in Maryland or Virginia, like they were closer um, to the North, closer to Canada. And so in terms of physical proximity, had more opportunity. Um, but also, like a small example is, if you if you run away, and your enslaver threatens to do something to your family or right. someone you love, that is very clearly going to be one mechanism by which um, you prevent people from from doing it. And I think just small things like that that don't occur to people all the time um, that the decisions people make are are not simply about them or what they want but it is there's a slavery impacted people as a community and the decisions people made about how to navigate that were, were grounded in community yeah yeah well, i mean your book the book i mean the places that you visit you, you sort of um talk about uh why these places and and recognize that another person visiting these places with a different identity or different experience would experience them differently but I, i'm really struck by by their courage that it took um, to, to visit some of these places and engage in some of these conversations and, and the patience. Um, and you know, obviously that struck me most um, in the chapters on Angola. And I'm still, um, I can't believe, I mean, there's things that you report that I feel like I should have known, like that there's a gift shop there. Yeah. Um, and, and then at Blanford Cemetery where, you're listening to stories that your book then demonstrates are false, 
but you're just still standing there listening to them. And so, I mean, what was it like to, to visit these places, you know? Yeah, I mean, in those, those places in particular were, I mean, they were fascinating, they were unsettling. I mean, Angola is one of the most haunting, unsettling yeah. places I've ever been in my life. And I've been working in prisons for the last seven years in Massachusetts and DC. And so I'm not unfamiliar with the landscape of, of what uh, carceral institution does, but the specific manifestations of what that looked like at Angola were unsettling. For, and for context for folks, you know, Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the country. It is 18,000 acres wide, bigger than the island of Manhattan. It is a place where 75% of the people held there are Black men, where 70% are mm -hmm. serving life sentences, uh, and it's built on a former plantation. And the, what I tell folks is that if you were to go to Germany and you had the largest maximum security prison in Germany, and it was built on top of a former concentration camp in which the people held there were disproportionately Jewish, that place would rightfully be a global emblem of anti-Semitism. It would be abhorrent, it would be disgusting. We would never allow a place like that to exist because it would so clearly run counter to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities. And yet here in the United States, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country where the vast majority of people held there are black men serving life sentences, many of whom were sentenced as children, many of whom were sentenced by non-unanimous juries, which has since been rendered unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, on land that was once a plantation where they themselves go out into those fields and work for virtually no pay while someone watches over them on horseback with a gun over their shoulder. And not only is that place not engaging in any sort of uh, interrogation, of its relationship to this history. Um, but as you mentioned, it has a gift shop. Yeah. <laughs> they sell baseball caps and sweatshirts and shot glasses and coffee mugs that have the silhouette of a watchtower and have written on the mug, uh, Angola, a gated community, to, to, as if they are making a mockery of or belittling the, the experiences of the thousands of people who are still incarcerated, incarcerated there today. And so when I go to, I mean, in a place like Angola, I was, I was really trying to understand how it understood, how Angola situated itself within that history, um, and then to what extent it understood the way that the remnants of how that institution continued to operate were shaped by, uh, again, as Sidious Hartman says, the afterlife of slavery. Right, yeah. and, and the parallels are so deeply unsettling there. Um, and Blandford is, I mean, that was interesting because I was there with the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, was, I was a conspicuous presence, as you can imagine. Um, and I really, I mean, I really was just curious. Like I'm really just a curious person. Um, and I really wanted, I knew that if I approached them, if I approached these Confederate reenactors and neo-Confederates, um, and you know, sons of Confederate veterans, United Daughters of the Confederacy, if I approach them in an antagonistic posture, right. then they would shut down or they would, I might put myself at risk. Um, they, and, and most importantly, they wouldn't be honest with me, right? Like it would become something, it would become something different than what I was trying to do. And maybe somebody else would have done it that way and, and it would have created its own sort of interest or richness or texture to write about, but but I really wanted to understand what leads someone to believe that slavery was not a central cause of the Civil War, or to understand the Confederacy as anything other than uh, an army predicated on maintaining the institution of slavery, when, when that is what it was, right? Even in, in the yeah. face of all of the empirical evidence, in the face of all the primary source documents, in the face of the declarations of Confederate secession in which they literally said it, like why they were seceding. Mississippi, for example, said our position is thoroughly aligned with the institution of slavery, the greatest material good uh, or the greatest material interest in the world. And so they were not vague about why they were seceding and why the civil war would be fought. They were quite clear about it. And yet part of what became clear is that for so many people, history is not based on primary source documents or empirical evidence. It is a story people tell, and it is a story that they are told. And it is uh, an heirloom that is deeply and entangled in a sort of emotional, uh, in emotional relationships that they have with their family and with community that have shaped how they understand who they are in relationship to the world. Um, and, and that sort of message and narrative gets propagated over time. Um, and so I, I just, 
you know, it wasn't as much, it wasn't even like I was trying to be generous. Um, I mean, I, I just wanted to, I just really wanted to know. I just wanted yeah. to understand. And I think the way you understand is you ask people questions and you let what they say speak for itself. You know, yeah. I think part of why that chapter is so compelling for many people um, and why the Atlantic chose it as its cover story last month is because I asked the questions and then you kind of, I, I let them say the things they believe and then I let the scholarship yeah. do, the, do the sort of work against it. Um, yeah. I don't need to make it turn it into a sort of didactic polemic. Um, that's just less interesting to me. What's more interesting is, is getting, actually seeing what people believe and then putting that right next to what actually transpired and what the historians and the primary source documents have to say for themselves. Yeah, well, it's extremely effective. I mean, I think I think it's extremely effective both as a writing and I think throughout the book, I, I, I might, the, the, the ways in which there are associations among where you are and the event, the historical events that are evoked and the scholarship that then come, comes into that, it, um, that that to me is your poetic imagination. I mean, I think that's that's the value of having poets write books like this is that that um, associative capacity to construct these very meaningful um, relationships among events and the and the present um, that is not strictly a chronological narrative, but that but that demonstrates the the incredible weight of these things on on places in the present. Um, I, I, I think we need to, I, there's everybody who's with us tonight, I know has questions for you. So I'm gonna stop asking those questions and invite Beth Helfrich to join us. Um, and we can turn to some, some audience questions now. Thank That's you okay. so much. Thanks, Carol. Um, before we jump into questions, I wanna say thank both of you. Thank you to both of you for this really important um, and meaningful conversation. And I wanted to give a special thanks to Clint on behalf of teachers and independent bookstores everywhere, you are such a champion for both. And um, we really appreciate you. Of course. Um, so first I just have to give a nod. There are several free word alums in the house who are giving props. So people, hi free word folks. Hello free word. <laughs> um, okay, we have a lot of questions. And so I'm gonna try to get through as many of them as I can. So the first one comes from Phil Lewis in the class of 1964. He says, your message and language are right on and uncompromisingly accurate. The problem, how do you convey it, not to your Davidson community that is here with you, but to all of those people, maybe a majority in the US, maybe not, um, who don't really wanna hear it or who aren't willing to reckon with it? Yeah, it is it is sort of the question um, on many fronts that we're sort of wrestling with right now. I mean, because we, we almost have, we have, people who live in like different epistemological universes, right? Where like they, are, they have just fundamentally different truths and understanding of what truth and knowledge are. Um, so I, what I will say is that like, I am personally less interested in attempting to convince someone of something who doesn't want to be convinced of it. I don't know that that is a, an, act, uh, an effective use of my time. Um, what I do, and I, so I think that there are people who don't want to no, learn certain things. Um, and I think that there are people who don't know certain things. And I'm, I'm more interested uh, in folks who would be open uh, to new information, but, but don't even know that they don't know it. So I think about the two women that I met at Monticello um, when I went, Donna and Grace. And it was a really important moment for me in the book because we were on this slavery at Monticello tour uh, in which David Thorson, this remarkable tour guide at Monticello, had given this 60-minute incredible pedagogical experience of uh, demonstrating Jefferson's relationship to slavery uh, and the lives of the enslaved people at Monticello. And Donna and Grace, I was watching them, and they were clearly unsettled by what they had heard. And I went up, went up to them after, and I was asking them how they experienced it. And they were like, I had no idea that Jefferson owned slaves. I had no idea that Monticello was a plantation. And mind you, these are folks who like bought plane tickets and like rented cars and got hotel rooms and like had a bed and breakfast, you know, like they did the whole thing, like a pilgrimage to the, to go to the home of Jefferson, but had no conception of this place being a plantation or the home of someone who enslaved hundreds of human beings, including four of their own children. And it was an important moment for me 
that reminded me that there's, there's millions of people across this country who just have not been taught about slavery in any way that is commensurate with the impact that it has had on our country. And, and that is not an excuse. I think, but I think we do have to realize that our education system continuously fails um, on this front. And it is not to say that education in and of itself will solve the problem. Donna and Grace could have left that day and none of their politics changed or none of their sensibilities changed or none of their empathy changed or none of their way of looking at the world may have changed. I don't know, uh, but I don't think that's up to any of us. I think what is up to us is trying to, or the way I think about it, is saying that there, I know how so much of this information over the past several years has been personally transformative for me. And I learned, I've learned so many things that I didn't no, and so many things I'm like, why didn't anybody teach me this in eighth grade social studies class, right? Like very basic things. I grew up like at a school named after a leader of the Confederacy and no one ever showed us or talked about the declarations of Confederate secession. And so you grow up with this mythology of the Confederacy being this thing that was simply defending themselves against the war of North, you know, the aggressive North and um, uh, preserving states' rights when it, was, when it was clearly not that. And they said it for themselves, but to, I was never presented with that sort of information. Um, so I think you try to meet people where they are. I think you extend generosity to people, but also make sure you hold them accountable, right? It's a sort of balance. You, ex you recognize that people have work to do for themselves in order to learn things they don't know. But there have also been many things that I haven't known that people have extended grace and generosity to me um, across a range of subjects that, that allowed me into uh, a new set of information and way of understanding the world that I otherwise wouldn't have had. Um, so I think it's a, a sort of balance between extending generosity and holding people accountable. I, I so appreciate that. And it actually ties into a question that has come up from a lot of attendees here tonight, which is about education. Um, obviously it's a very topical, very relevant topic right now in the news headlines. Um, so several people asked some iteration of this question, which is at the same time that your books like yours are coming out and helping so many people come, so many Americans become more aware of history or, or, the, or troubling the narrative, so to speak. Um, there's an active movement by state legislatures to prohibit that, to push back against um, any uh, use of sources or any, any narrative that, that is a little sticky or, or, or that is rooted in a truth um, and an ugly truth. So can you speak a little bit about what's happening right now and some of the tension that is playing out in schools right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a, it's quite a moment for the book to, to arrive in the world. Um, totally. It's just, you it was like start a book four years ago and you have no idea like what sort of moment it will come into, but I, I don't know that I anticipated like state legislatures attempting to suppress people teaching the history of slavery, but maybe I should have. Um, I think that part of the insidiousness of the project of white supremacy is that it attempts to take empirical statements and turn them into ideological ones, right? So it attempts to, if I say, like I said before, the Confederacy was a treasonous territory uh, that raised an army predicated on maintaining and expanding the institution of slavery. To many people, if I said that in a classroom, that would be reflective of me attempting to indoctrinate students with my political beliefs or my ideological sensibilities. When it in, it's just true, when it's just like actually fact, when it's actually grounded in historical and empirical evidence. But that is what has been happening since the end of uh, the, the Civil War. That's when what's been happening since the mid 19th century is this attempt to distort or, or make, to, to render fact political, to, to make it so that stating uh, something that is true uh, is seen as like potentially controversial. Uh, and that is part of what the legislation that we're seeing now is attempting to do is to create a chilling effect where teachers don't even want to touch the subject in the way, I mean, that we barely, most teachers barely touch the subject now, but now they really don't want you to touch the subject because teachers work so hard and they don't want to get in trouble and they don't want, they're just going to like try to figure out the path of least resistance um, in order to, to continue to, um, do what they do uh, or need to do in their classrooms. That is the intent um, of what folks are trying to do. I've all, I'm also heartened by the fact that part of why they are doing it now is because I think now 
certainly more than I've ever experienced in my lifetime, there is a more, uh, there's a wider and more sophisticated understanding of how history has shaped our current world. Um, and more people are a part of that. More people have the language and the resources and the tools. There are more books on it. There are people have more access to it. Teachers have more resources with which to teach it. And I think that is directly attributed to the Black Lives Matter movement. The same way that during the civil rights movement, um, like a thing that people don't always know is that the way that the sort of slavery was collectively understood in this country, um, in the public consciousness until the mid 20th century was that it was a civilizing institution. That it was, as John Calhoun said, a, a positive good for both black and white people alike, that it was rescuing black people from the savagery of Africa. And it was actually, there were so many benevolent slave owners who were bestowing Christianity and, and civilization on black people. And this was the predominant view by historians like Ulrich B. Phillips until the mid 20th century. And then you had historians like Kenneth Stamp who, who write work that, uh, and a, a host of social historians during the, inspired by the civil rights movement who start to ground the history of slavery as the origin point for black white inequality um, in, in that we were seeing in the country then and that we continue to see now. And I think similarly, because social movements not only create political change with like a big P, but they create a sort of social and cultural shift that provides space and, uh, and opens up space um, for more people to have access to sets of information that help them make sense of the world in better ways. So, in, you know, I always tell people that in 2012, if you ask somebody what redlining was, they would have been like, is that a new type of makeup? Like, is that Rihanna's new makeup line or lipstick? And, and now more people understand, have a more sophisticated lexicon and framework with which to understand how racism manifests itself and understand that it's not just an interpersonal phenomenon, but a systemic one, a structural one, a historical one. Um, and that is what these folks are scared of. Because when more people understand the history of this country, this country can't lie to you anymore. It can't, and, and it shatters the sort of myth of meritocracy. It shatters the idea that the reason people do or don't have certain things is simply because they did or did not work hard. Um, because what is actually grounding it is because certain resources were given to certain communities and taken away from other communities. And the more acute a sense you have of that, the more clearly you're able to sort of look around this country and say like, oh, like this is this the whole time this country tried to make it seem like it was on me or it was on us or that these people deserve it and these people don't. Um, but it was never about that. It was about something um, much deeper and, and more insidious than that. Yes, and what we can all be heartened um, by seeing books like yours uh, atop the bestseller list. I know that the classroom's not the only place, the books are not the only place, um, but the fact that so many titles in this year, especially in 2020, have um, gotten into so many hands, I think is a, is a very encouraging moment. Um, okay, Bai from the class of, I think he's 04, um, mm -hmm. asks, and this is a question for both of you to chime in on, um, Dr. Quill and you as well. How should Davidson reckon with its history of slavery, as well as connections between past school leaders and the Confederacy? Dr. Quillen, I don't know, lead on this one. Um, so I think, you know, taking some advice from Clint, I think it's really important that we be thorough and honest and that we equip ourselves and our students and our community with the tools we need um, to produce more accurate histories of, of, the, of this institution, both to acknowledge the contributions of Black people to the existence of Davidson, and also to acknowledge the harm done, and 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 to be able to to be able to speak about that um, with honesty. And so, I'm a huge shout out to our faculty members who are equipping students to go into the archives here and elsewhere and recover stories not told, stories that are um, hiding in the interstices of the stories we do tell, stories that are um, made invisible by the tightness of the narratives to which we are wedded, and how do we, how do we um, deconstruct those existing narratives and liberate these stories so that we can have a more honest and holistic and comprehensive view of ourselves, precisely so that we can 
be accountable in the present and for the present that we are continuing to build every day. Um, I don't know if that's a complete or like a, I don't know if that exactly addresses your question, but, but I think, I think that's a start, right? Taking, taking from Clint this notion that um, we need to reckon with the past. We need to acknowledge the weight that the past has in the present and we need to understand it if we're going to be able to see that and change it. Yeah. And I would just add, um, obviously I'm not intimately familiar or involved in the sort of uh, intricacies of how this is playing out at Davidson. I know it's an ongoing process. Um, I mean, I would say it is the process of sort of interrogating and excavating the sort of personal relationship of the institution to, to this history. Um, and then part of the whole thing, whether it's Davidson or anywhere, is that uh, a more accurate understanding of this history shapes what sort of policies and initiatives are created moving forward. Because once you have a better sense of the history um, and the harm that has been done, you can more effectively make amends for that harm. And then, and part of what I think also, and I don't know what it will look like at Davidson, but I think part of the project is also attempting to create a common uh, sort of foundation of information and knowledge from which everyone related to the Davidson community is operating so that folks know this is the relationship that this um, institution has had to, uh, to slavery and, and all of its insidious sort of manifestations and iterations over, over generations and over time. And once we have an understanding of that, then I think initiatives and policies and efforts to make amends for that, that to someone who isn't familiar with the history might seem you know, people use all sort of like, like reverse discrimination or like unfair treatment or just, or um, make, you know, providing access to some resources for certain communities and not others. We're able to sort of push back more effectively against that because like actually what we are attempting to do is fill in gaps and repair harm that has been done, not uh, provide some, some group of people or some people with things that they, they don't necessarily deserve. So I think that just grounding, giving people the same information with which to um, even have the discussion uh, makes makes a big difference. And and it, so it is both the the reckoning and the having of that information collectively, but also um, the material uh, resources that are like then given to different groups of people um, in order to make uh, real amends for that. Yeah, and, and I would say to, to take responsibility for constructing the present that we wish to live in. I think that's the, you know, when you don't know, when you can't, when you don't know, you, you don't see how, the, how, this, how this all happened and you can't, you, you're, you're paralyzed in the face of it because you, you can't, you don't understand it. Um, so, yeah, that could, this could be its own Zoom call. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, know. I, I appreciate both of you tackling that question with vulnerability and authenticity, um, and thanks for fielding it. Um, okay, I have a couple of uh, English teacher questions coming through. So um, one is from Ellen from the class of 1999. Um, your talk is making me think so much about teaching Toni Morrison's beloved um, how has fiction impacted your work with history and poetry? And then the follow-up question to that is, there's someone who's in the audience, um, Angela, who says, since you're a poet, what value is there in listening to the audiobook of your um, book versus in print? So those are kind of twofold yeah. questions. Uh, I mean, one, Toni Morrison is, I mean, there, there's a reason I opened the book um, with a quote from Toni Morrison, um, who is just, I mean, I saw, I saw her in person at Harvard my second year. Um, and, and it was, I think I had a moment. There are certain people when you see them alive in front of you, you're kind of like, it's amazing that you're still on the, like I still share the same planet with you. You know, like, like I feel that way about, I felt that way about Toni Morrison. I still feel that way about, um, I felt that way about John Lewis when he was alive. I was like, man, John Lewis is still, like it is remarkable that I still am on earth with this person. And so, I mean, Tony is, 
Toni Morrison is every, I mean, she's everything. She like laid the groundwork for so many, for me and all of my peers um, and friends and contemporaries. I mean, our work is only possible because of her um, in so many ways, in so many ways. So fiction, uh, literary fiction has been, uh, was a huge inspiration for this book. Cause I, I, I wanted to take the best of the history of slavery. I wanted to take the books by Annette Gordon Reed and Dinah Rainey Berry and, um, Kevin Levin, David Blight, and Ira Berlin, and Leslie Harris, and Walter Johnson, and, and all of these folks who've done incredible work, whose books have been transformative for me, and to give it a sort of poetic texture, um, and to give it, to provide sensory details, like what do these places look like, and feel like, and smell like, what does the air taste like, who are the people responsible for telling the stories of this land, what are their backstories, what are their, like I wanted it to feel novelistic, I wanted the people that I meet to feel three-dimensional. I didn't want them to feel like caricatures. I wanted the land and the scenery to feel cinematic. I wanted it to, I wanted it to be a history book that read like a novel that made it feel like the person that the reader was on the journey with me. Um, and I, you know, tell, nobody does that better than, than Ms. Morrison and um, so many other writers who, who've been um, fiction writers who like really in, inspired me in, in a huge way. So yeah, fiction, I mean, I probably read as much fiction during this process as I did books of history, because um, that, that was really important for me for it to read well. Um, and then the audiobook, man, I love audiobooks. I've gotten so into audiobooks over the pandemic. Like if I'm washing the dishes or folding the laundry, mm -hmm. it is like me and a good audio. It, it actually like makes uh, folding the, like doing the dishes like a, a pleasurable experience because because I'm like, oh, I'm reading. And I'm like scrubbing, the, you know, macaroni and cheese off the plate. Um, and it was, I mean, especially during the pandemic when it was so hard to like focus and I was just so tired. And um, I, I love audiobooks. And I wrote, I read my audiobook and it was exhausting. Um, and shout out to the, edit, the editing team um, for Hachette Audio because they made it sound real smooth um, when I was like stumbling and starting through. But uh, but yeah, I've, I've not actually listened to the whole audiobook. I listened like the first 15 minutes just to make sure I didn't sound wild. Um, but I was like, I can't listen to 10 hours of myself. That's too much. <laughs> um, but I hope you buy the audiobook. Um, I, and people have said they, they enjoy it. Um, but I think, I mean, audiobooks are great. I should also say Libro FM, Libro.fm is the best place uh, to do your audiobooks. Um, I've switched, I know a lot of people use Audible. I've like canceled my Audible account and I use only Libro FM, which uh, supports independent bookstores. And you can select which independent, you can select Main Street Books and say, I want to support Main Street Books with each audiobook I buy. Um, and it's a great gift card. All I do is give people Libro FM gift cards and, and credits now. Um, so that's a long way of saying shout out to audiobooks. Uh, I hope you listen to the audiobook on your, while you're doing your laundry and, and washing. <laughs> I promise this is not a, a Libro FM sponsored event, but we Libro FM, yes, I appreciate that shout out. It is an indie friendly um, alternative. Um, okay, we've got time for one last question and we're staying in the wheelhouse of books. So um, Jamie from the class of 2007 says, alongside your book, you've been talking about your, um, your debut or, or publication date buddy, um, Ashley C. Ford's new book, Somebody's Daughter, and I saw today that you recently finished The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, which oh. we have huge fans here at Main Street Books. Um, are there any other books on your bookshelf behind you? I see John Green. He's another recent, um, um, recently published. Any any titles you'd recommend, and what's on your summer reading list? Who? Um, what is on, I mean, John Green, my guy, um, Anthropocene reviewed. Most people know him from uh, from Crash Course and the Vlogs Brothers and uh, The Fault in Our Stars. But like, this is a nonfiction debut. Just like he's such a thoughtful. I know John because he invited me to do Crash Course, um, and so I teach the Crash Course Black American History series, um, which has been so fun. And uh, this is just like a beautiful, thoughtful, meditative nonfiction debut. It's the whole conceit is that it's like reviews of random things in the world like Haley's Comet or Mario Kart or and it's just like poignant and also delightful um and he really like made it clear that he's just like I think sometimes there can be a stigma about YA writers and they can only write YA but um 
one, that's not true. Also, two, why his books are fantastic and everybody should read them. Um, but he has very much cemented himself as like, he can write across any genre and it's great. Um, Jumba Lahiri's new book, The Whereabouts. I just started that. I'm a, I'm a Jumba Lahiri stan. I like The Lowlands. Uh, Interpreter of Maladies is the, probably still the best uh, short story collection I've ever read. Oh my gosh, I love that. The first, the first joint in there, um, a temporary, a temporary matter. Um, you should all Google that tonight. It is so good. It's devastating. And just, oh, I don't know how she does it. Um, Most in Hamid's Exit West. That's like a book that I've read. I don't reread a lot of books, but I've read, reread that book like five times. Um, so good. Uh, I, my book was very much inspired by Yaa Jesse's Homegoing, um, which is a sort of intergenerational story of two sisters and their offspring and intergenerationally and how they go in different directions. Um, what else have I been reading lately? I mean, just uh, Halfway Home by Ruben, uh, Ruben Jonathan Miller. It's like, I've read a lot of books around mass incarceration and this is one of the best that I've, I've ever read. Um, just his brother is in, was incarcerated and it's sort of it's like a sociological memoir and mm -hmm. like his proximity to the issue makes it such a poignant read and way like it, it is clearly so much more than an academic project for him um empire of pain patrick Bratton keith this guy man you talk about like a master of narrative nonfiction. i read say nothing um over the pandemic or i listened to it um great audiobook and and i was like how did this he's a staff if you're not familiar with patrick Bratton keith he's a staff writer for the new yorker um and just like takes troughs of archival material and legal briefs and history and uses it to create like a true crime thriller. So say nothing. I was like, this is one of the best nonfiction books I've ever read. And I heard he had a new book coming out and I was like, but he can't top say nothing. But he, I mean, it's, it's, it's close or better. Um, this is about the Sackler family and uh, Purdue Pharma and the opioid crisis and like how this family was at the center of it. Um, and it is, it's just so good. He's so good at what he does. Um, this could also be its own thing. A classic, he was my dissertation advisor and you just can't go wrong. Or he was on my dissertation committee, Matthew Desmond evicted. Just like one of the, when I think about the models of what good nonfiction, like readable, compelling narrative nonfiction grounded in an effort to address an injustice looks like. I mean, it, Matt, Matt's the goat. Um, we go on and on. All right. Last I know. One. I have I have another request in the um, chat for a separate Zoom event. Very, best biography on ever. this. Incredible. Okay. I'm going to stop now. No, I'm glad you I'm glad you held that one up. I've spied it on your shelf. Um, yes, we have requests for future Zoom events um, with Clint Smith book recommendations. Book um, <laughs> I'm seeing everybody saying, "Can you post this list? Please post this list. We'll get those." in writing to y'all. Um, we have reached nine o'clock, which means we have to let you go. And on behalf of Davidson College and Main Street Books, a huge thank you first to you, Dr. Quillen, for such a meaningful conversation, um, for your willingness to trouble the narrative yourself and for championing wildcats everywhere, wherever we are and in whatever field. So thank you, Carol Quillen. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Beth. And Clint, thank you so much for, for being here with us. It really means a lot. It's great to see you in this way. And um, uh, we are we're really fortunate to be on this book tour, a stop on this book tour. And what a fantastic book. I really thank you for writing it. Yes. Um, Clint Smith, gratitude, gratitude, gratitude for your time tonight for this book. Um, a huge congratulations for its reception um it's it's rightfully received and i can really think of no one more deserving so we are so grateful that you took the time to come back hopefully it'll be in person next time it's your so. next so. <laughs> the next tour and to you audience thank you so much for being here for showing up and for your commitment to reckoning yourself i bid you all good night thank you all so much mm -hmm.